Uh, tonight's theme is called the neptic way. The word neptic comes from the Greek word nipsis, nipsis, which means uh, roughly translated to be um, watchful, beditina. And we apply it to guarding the mind, guarding the thoughts. And so you'll find references um, to what they call the neptic fathers, which are all the fathers of the church, of course, because that's what they practice. Um, this is something we need to know about, and maybe we're not always aware that this is basic Christianity. This is the way, is that we should be watchful and guarding our thoughts, because we are being invaded by thoughts 24-7, all the time. And we have no control over that. Well, we think, if we think we do, we are actually wrong, misapprehension, because it's, in fact, impossible to stop the thoughts coming. You can't stop them coming to you, but there is a method where you do not have to accept them. And unfortunately, the, the temptation of these to indulge in this type of thinking um, is very strong, and so you have to train yourself not to respond. It's like being provoked by somebody, you know, you say to them, well, don't respond to them. Somebody provokes you, just ignore it. So in the similar sense, so we have some experience on how to deal with it, and we can actually cut, cut out some thoughts. I mean, I think in times when one is grieving, uh, one can dwell, you know, on, on the sadness of the occasion, having lost somebody, a loved one, that of course, and we should be grieving, but that should be only for a short time. Otherwise, it becomes an obsession. And it is very sad because some elderly people that I've met in my lifetime have been uh, never been able to reconcile the fact that their partner has gone and they can't live life anymore. And, and this is tr a tragic because this is um, basically it's lack of faith because we have faith in the resurrection. So yes, there's a period of grief, but it's followed by joy because of the resurrection and the potential of eternity. But I think we're afraid of eternity, and this is something we don't really want to discuss. So what's this got to do with the, with the <coughs> neptic way? It's because we have to be very watchful. Now, there is um, Saint uh, Nikiphorus, who was a 14th century Athenite monk, in fact the teacher of Saint Gregory Palamas at one time, and he says that you, we, as Orthodox Christians, we want to feel, yes is it, we want to feel the divine fire of Christ that it is in us. We need to be reconciled with God and we need to feel, feel this in, in, in our hearts. Um, if you're in love with somebody, you, you feel it in your heart. I mean, that's the only emotion I can really compare it with. And so there should be that same feeling, but this is, this is for God. But I think sometimes we're outward looking instead of inward looking. We don't realize that through baptism, we have put on Christ. Through baptism, we receive Christ within us. And so there's no excuse to say, you know, Christ isn't in me. Now your behavior would indicate that he isn't. Yeah, our behavior and our struggle and our weaknesses and all the stupid things we do. In, in the struggles, but Christ is already within. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It's not outside you. It's within you now. Now, with the capital, capital letters. It's not something in some human hereafter. It's now. And so the fathers say, Saint Nicky Forrest says, you have to feel this. Is it just emotions? No. It's because there is a method and that method is to be able to enter to the heart, cut off these thoughts that annoy us 24-7, which are there all the time, and actually to be able to switch them off by descending into the heart and praying. It's only through prayer. So how do we do this thing? So Mark, the ascetic, says it is through asceticism. Asceticism meaning prayer, fasting, almsgiving, in some cases vigil, 
and don't expect us to be doing vigil, but that's what monks do, stay up at night and pray. Uh, many people actually do do that, actually pray for the world. Not necessarily monks or nuns, but ordinary lay people, especially uh, some of the elderly, spend their time in prayer. This is a wonderful opportunity if you're in a, uh, you know, an old people's home where you can't do anything physically uh, because you're chair bound or bent and there, but you can pray. But if we pray with just in the head here, in the intellect, the mind, soon we we'll get very bored of it, get fed up with it actually. But when we begin to pray with the prayer in the heart, which is the Jesus prayer, and you all know that, and you can all say it, and we all should be using it in the moment that a thought comes. Um, as a priest, I, I'm plagued with particular thoughts, okay, and I'm very relieved to find out this is common for clergy, and uh, which I'm not going to mention because it would be a temptation to everybody else here, but that thought, those thoughts or thought it comes every time, and it'll especially come tomorrow because, or tonight because I'm serving in liturgy tomorrow. Somebody in here, not you, I mean, in the world around doesn't want me to serve in liturgy tomorrow. They hate it. They fear, they're afraid. So they start planting thoughts. Now I recognize them, and I say, Lord Jesus Christ, somebody would have mercy upon me, a sinner, and I keep saying it, and it goes away. Well, it doesn't go away, it withdraws. You mustn't be uh, naive about this. These thoughts don't go away. They retreat. And then when we are not neptic, when we're not vigilant or careful, then they come back again. And so we're plagued. And this is part of the Christian struggle. And it ain't going to go away. It's with us until the end. But we know how to deal with it. We deal with it with inner prayer. So on a, on a practical level, as I'm saying to you, when I get these thoughts, which will come tonight, they haven't come yet, but they will, and I will say, oh, Jesus Christ, I'll never have mercy in your sin, and keep saying that until the demons get fed up and leave off. <laughs> Don't go away, but they will uh, no, stop annoying me. I want, from the life of St. Anthony the Great, um, one day he was on his mountain um, with disciples, and there were two young men coming along the road, and they were dying of thirst, literally dying. And one of them actually dropped dead. And the other one was near, you know, exhaustion, near uh, fainting, and he fell down on the road. And St. Anthony was in prayer in his heart while he's talking. He's talking to his disciples, but he's, he's at the same time he's praying, the Jesus prayer. And God reveals to him the fact that there's somebody on the road that needs help. So he says, quick. Go down, down, go down the mountain. I mean, I don't know how high the mountain, and it's you know we're not interested in that area. That's those details. He said, go up to the road that goes to Egypt, and you will find two men there. One is dead, but the other one can be revived. Take water. So they ran down, you know, with their skins of water, found the young man, revived him, gave him to drink, and then they took him up to the mountain to Saint Anthony, because that's where they were going to go, and. St. Anthony knew this through prayer because he's, he's had sobriety of heart, because he was praying, not letting the, the thoughts, you know, from outside or anything to do, but he was able, God was able to give him the gift of clairvoyance so he could see what was happening. Now you might ask, well, why did he, why didn't God tell St. Anthony before that the other person needed water? And the answer, God's affair not ours. Another famous father was uh, Saint Theodosius, Fyodor of Jerusalem. Now he, he was a founder of monasteries. He's famous, he, he has a special title. Um, and he had lots of monks, hundreds of monks in, in monasteries that he founded. And he was busy all the time planning if you were going to build a monastery. I think this is, you know, the dean knows about that, or we all know about it. You, there's a lot of work that you have to do in planning. At the same time, he was permanently in prayer. In, in fact, I believe it's the prayer, in the prayer, that lay, enabled him to do the things that he did. And however much he was stressed by work or the demands of hundreds of monks and we, wanting to talk to him, pilgrims, he was relaxed. And it's said that he, he gave consolation to anybody that came to him. Anybody that had to be corrected, he corrected them with love. 
this is very important actually, to be able to correct people with love uh, and not with a stick. And it applies to all of us actually, this is very important to, to understand that. But this is because his life was based on prayer, inner prayer. He was a neptic father, he was observant of the, you know, the temptations. So he, you can't say, well, you know, it's, it's easy for St. Anthony because he's up in the mountain, he's a monk, he's a, you know, a, a chelnik, a recluse. Or what about Theodosius? Complete opposite world, but on the same, same caliber, same spiritual caliber. I'm thinking also, I have a note here, Father Alexei Michov, who was a starlet in Moscow in the turn of the century, 19, turn of the century meaning 1900s. Um, contemporary for a while of St. John of Kronstadt, but I don't know whether they knew each other. But St. Alexei, um, well he's a saint now, he's canonized recently, um, he lived as a starlet in the middle of Moscow with all the noise and, and the busyness going on. Actually, what amazes me is that he had a telephone in his house and it rang 24-7. Now, he had a wife, Matushka, so I'm think, and, and, maybe, and he had a son, a famous son, who actually became a martyr, uh, martyr for um, Sergei. And so they probably helped to answer calls from the phone, but he was available to everybody. And he was a very timid, quiet man, apparently totally unassuming, he didn't say anything, but people were drawn to him because he was a boy, he had prayer. He was a neptic father in the middle of the city, surrounded by hundreds of people that came for help. And he wasn't some sort of dynamic personality, great charisma, no, he was a very quiet, very shy person, but people could come and talk to him and he could tell them things. He was clairvoyant as well. I'm not sure about healing. Um, I haven't come across that yet. Now, the, the, the ascetic life is important. To pray, to fast, to go to church, to go to confession, to prechastia. But all these things, according to Abba Agathon, another desert father, are leaves on the tree. They're not fruit, but the tree has to bear fruit as well. Now let's think about this for a moment, okay? We, we, you know, we pray and when we go to church and, and we sing in the choir and we give, you know, we feed the hungry by making donations. We help the the, the children in, in Pakrov in Moscow um, orphanage. We've helped other people, other situations. We we do a collection. All this is good, but this these are leaves. In other words, good works don't necessarily lead to salvation. This is quite a shocking thing, actually, to think about. It doesn't necessarily lead to salvation. Being a good person does not lead to salvation. It's being, being a fruit, and the fruit is through asceticism. It is through the prayer of the heart. Because without this inner prayer, we are listening to the thoughts. Somebody said this about me, or somebody did this, somebody did something else, and they said, you know, and immediately we're caught into this. It is a whirlpool of the world. Well, I, I, you know, I, I can't go to church because I have to work. Now, that's true in some cases. Today it is, that's unfortunate. But in other cases, it's because I need money. And I'm worried because I, you know, have to pay bills and this. And this is the world which is incringing on our spiritual life. No, you don't have to go to Mount Athos. You don't have to go into the desert to pray. You do it here. And when we pray about everything that happens, then we, the worries that we have and responsibilities begin to take place themselves because you, you're opening yourself up to God and God is able to work through you. The kingdom of heaven is already within you. You're beginning to discover it and, and uh, realize the power of grace. If we keep the commandments, do the things I've just told you, this is our duty. Because we are servants of, of Christ. And so this is our duty. And if a servant serves his master, he doesn't expect necessarily, he'd like to have a reward, but he can't go up to the master and say, now I've done, you know, all these things, now pay me. It doesn't work like that. 
If Christ rewards us, it's because his, he wants to, by his love and for his grace for us. So you can't earn sonship or daughtership. You can't earn it by practicing uh, good things. I'm not expecting you or myself to really understand this, actually, but it's something we need to think about. Let's pray. I think we will understand it if we use the prayer of the heart. Then we'll have an answer to things like, well, how does this affect me? How can I do this? This is too complicated. Too far too complicated. Yes, but once you start to pray about something, people say to me, well, I want to say a prayer. What do I have to say? And I say, I'm using the feminine, okay, because it's women more than men that ask me um, about these things. So, no, you don't have to think up what, what to say. There's, you know what to say, because you're opening up your heart. And then God is able, like St. Anthony, to work through you, to your families, in, in situations where you have clients or whatever you have you are available and instead of using your brain and your mind in order to come up with clever answers or helpful answers because we want to we help want to help people this will come through prayer it'll be different sometimes the fathers you know somebody would visit them and uh, they would say no i'm not talking to them send them away this happened many times with russian fathers opting it no that's it and others, yes. How did they make that decision? Well, they didn't do it because they had a list of, you know, requirements, like going for a job interview. It's because in, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave and said, no, you're quiet. Yes, help. And I would tell you what to say. Christ says that. Don't worry what you have to say. I would tell you. The Holy Spirit would tell you. We have to believe that in our lives. Otherwise, our faith, our orthodoxy, is a belief. And at the worst end of the belief is the philosophy. And even worse than that is a religion. And it isn't any of those things. It's a living experience, feeling of the presence of God inside us. And we think, wow, well that's, you know, how can that be? I'm such a terrible sinner. Well, start praying and you'll find out that experience and what, how to, to correct your life. It says that um, the kingdom of God is now and we need to lead an angelic life. When we think of people leading angelic life, it's usually monastics. But we need to create our own monasticism in the world, so we're all monastics, all of us. Married, whatever, it doesn't matter. But we can lead an angelic life only through the heart, prayer. Stop those thoughts, stop this, in Greek they call it logismos, which means a jumble of words going on all the time, you know that. What happens when you go to sleep? The garbage that comes up in your mind, when you, because you've got, got no control, when you're asleep, only the subconscious, and so all, all sorts of jumbled things come to your mind. And the demons add a little bit, you know, they put a little bit of salt and pepper in as well to make it stir up the mix, to make it really evil and disgusting. So you wake up and think, wow, what a weird dream I had. Is it surprising? No, it should not be. But when we pray before we go to sleep, we bless our bed, there's less chance of, of that sort of um, commotion. But it depends on your life, doesn't it? It depends what you're doing, whether you have those commotions. Uh, maybe you have worries and then they come out in the dreams. But we should, every time, ignore them. And I, I think people are blessed who wake up and say, well, I had a really bad dream, but I don't remember it. Slava Borgos, <laughs> glory to God, it's good, it's good. Because that's another way the demons, if they can't get through the brain, we we'll get through the subconscious when we're asleep because we're not in control. But we're, we're not at fault. It's not a sin. But it is a weakness. And I think we could prevent it.
back on the yes. Oh, I see. We spend too much time and effort in the world around us. Worries, fears, anxiety, and all these are products of the fallen world. But we live in, in the real world, which is the spiritual world. We live here. Yeah, of course we're living in the world. We have to eat and sleep and work. No, nobody's denying that, but that is secondary. It's not what it's all about. Um, it says, um, the fathers say, we, we mistake mirages for the truth. Do you all know what a mirage is? Do you know what a mirage? Yeah? I remember cycling in England on a hot road um, on a hot summer's day and looking at it, and I could see all this water running down the road. Of course, it's mm -hmm. just... Uh, it's not actually a real mirage. A real mirage is actually, you know, they, you see a palm trees and water and that. I mean, again, there's nothing there. I mean, you all know from that from films. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's experienced that. But it's a mirage. And so most of the things that we think about, um, it says here, we mistake mirages for the truth. So how do we know the truth? How can we recognize the truth? How can you recognize that you have to make an important decision in your life, especially younger people who are going into careers? How do you do it? How do you not make a mistake? You enter into the heart, you pray about it, you say the Jesus prayer, say, I would like to do this, and you start saying the prayer. Then five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, a long time not even realizing how long it's been. That would be wonderful. Okay, that's the ideal. So just put a timer on, five minutes and say, I'll say to Jesus for five minutes and see what happens. Do it. It works. You suddenly think, no, I'm not going to do that. I should do this. And you know, you're right. Or well, somebody's right. Maybe not you, but your guardian angel is definitely in on, the, uh, in on it. We, people are 99% imprelist. 99% imprelist. Deluded. That's not negative. I think it's very positive. Say, right, okay, we're all in prelos. Prelos. We're all deluded. So how do I not be deluded? Jesus Christ, I would have mercy on your sinner. Go off to your icon corner. You know, the phone rings and you have to make a decision. Now, you know, I want to talk to you about your bank account or something, you know. You go off the, to your icon corner and say prayer. For a few minutes and then go back and answer. Try these things, be scientific, test it. Don't let it be a, a theory. Oh, well, that sounds really good. No, do it. Our fight, oh, we fight to keep our heads above water, especially in, in, in relation to finance, health that's a big issue. You're not allowed to be unhealthy, you're neglecting yourself. Now, obviously, common sense says that uh, you have to look after yourself. No one's arguing about that. But it have to be, when it becomes a, a thing in itself, health craze, let's put it that way. This is also like these books of self-help books, self-improvement books. It all becomes a craze. It's, it's, it's prelice, absolutely deception. We fight to keep our heads above water, in financial sense, health, but these things are, only t are temporal. They are a tiny little speck compared with eternity. Let me talk about eternity in, in the next talk because this is some, completely something um, far greater. And as the, the Apostle says to the Ephesians, our fight is against the rulers of darkness of this world. That's who we're fighting. Not our neighbour. Not our enemies, so-called enemies, but the spiritual forces of darkness. And it also a quote here, who will be a friend of the world, who will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That's pretty uh, startling. Father John Romanides, who, who was a theologian um, uh, who of the 20th century, I don't remember when he died, I don't know the dates, um, he said that 
the problem is that we have, people have different levels of what he calls noetic faculty. Noetic, again, is a neptic. All these words are fully interchangeable. Some people have different levels, and some people have different rational levels. Now, rational levels we all know. We're talking about being smart, okay, intelligent, passing exams. That's rational, okay, but noetic, spiritual level, is something different. He says there are four types. Now, this is just his opinion, all right? This is something which I picked up. One, little attainments, intellectual, very little, maybe no schooling, hardly any, who rise to the highest level of noetic perfection. So, very little education, but very high level spiritual wisdom, gifts of God. Such as, who are these people? St. Siloan, St. Paisius, St. Porphyrius, Jacobus, Mary of Egypt, Matrona, Pelagea. No education, but on, on, on a, a level that we cannot even, even imagine. Okay, that's one category, one. Number two. Some achieve the highest intellectual attainment, right? Higher intellectual, but they have no noetic. Their level of noetic is even uh, to the level of imperfection. Who are these people? I've got here philosophers. Certainly, today's philosophers. They're not nothing compared with the, with the real philosophers of the ancients. So, some scientists and academic teachers. High attainment, high intellect, fantastic degrees and, and, and scholarship, and have the lowest level of a spiritual knowledge. Let's put it that way, noetic faculty. Number three, reach both the highest intellectual attainments and the highest noetic perfection. Well, who are they? High intellect, high spiritual wisdom. We call them the great fathers of the church, which includes mothers. And in, in particular, we think of uh, the three hierarchs, St. John Chrysostom, St. John, St. John of St. Gregory the Theologian, Basil the Great, St. John of Damascus, St. Maximus the Confessor. They were high, very high intellectuals higher attainment in, in intellectually and spiritually. And they are neptic fathers. And then the fourth is a meagre intelligence, very little intelligence, and a hardening of the heart. And he says, John, Father John says, and that's the majority of people. And I leave that food for thought. <laughs> okay, and I'll finish off with a quote. St. Macarius, no, sorry, St. Mark the ascetic, unearth the treasure buried in the field of your hearts. In other words, dig up the treasure buried here in your heart, not out there somewhere that you have to achieve, it's here. Know and experience the kingdom of heaven which is within you. Keep your attention on the kingdom that is within, so that you can be united with God, who, through his divine love, created you for that purpose.